Hello together and welcome back to our channel. So today, Christopher and I have chosen a very interesting topic, I think. I hope you will agree. And we plan to discuss um, different forms of government like monarchy and republic and perhaps aristocracy and compare them with each other. And also at the same time, consider um, the role of consequences in, in ethics. So, um, <clears throat> because there is the idea that you can um, decide um, ethics based on principles. And then there is the other idea that with that which really matters is uh, consequences. And so we thought it would be interesting to combine these two topics and, and see where, where this takes us. So I guess, Christopher, it would be helpful to start with a couple of definitions. And I don't know, perhaps um, we can define a little bit more precisely uh, different approaches to, to deciding whether something is uh, ethical or not and perhaps also define these different forms of government. Thank you, Amos. Now, these concepts are deep and comprehensive. So I'm not sure if I can give a, an exhaustive, uh, comprehensive definition of them all, but we can at least give it a try and see where it leads us. Now, to start off with the ideas concerning government and political theory and the different forms of government, monarchy, republic, first we could attempt to define government. As some of the listeners might uh, know, Amos and I, we have discussed uh, ideas connected to government uh, in previous conversations. For instance, is it okay to overthrow government and if so, when? Uh, and the metaphysical basis for government. So the concept of government is, is a very central concept. And I suppose I would say that government would be some form of organization or entity that directs and guides and protects a particular social community. So as uh, we both know, human beings are social animals. We organize ourselves into communities where we have some sort of um, relationship with others, uh, which could be intimate, uh, like in family or, or friends and neighbors, and, and then more broadly, uh, fellow citizens in a specific community. That community has certain common goods, both economic material goods, but also cultural goods and spiritual goods. And we see that there must be some entity or organization that protects that community and its goods, both from foreign uh, interference, uh, enemies from other countries or communities, or from um, corruption or uh, uh, destruction, riots, uh, rebellion, uh, crimes and, and criminals uh, inside that community. So it, it helps the community to, to be taken care of. Uh, and it also has a role in directing different um, organs of that community to do its specific job. Uh, so it protects and it guides and it directs to a certain degree. So that is how I would understand government. And then there's the question of, okay, exactly how should that entity of government uh, operate? Should it be one person that is commanding others, which would uh, perhaps be called monarchy? Should it be a small group of people, an aristocracy? Or should the government in either direct or indirect means be in the hands of all the members of community? or a significant portion of that community. So that is an interesting question. I would maintain that that entity uh, should be uh, uh, governed or operated uh, according to the principles of monarchy, that there should be a monarch 
that directs and guides. I do not uh, support absolute monarchy. There should be limits, checks and balances in various forms, but at least I think the idea of monarchy uh, makes sense. So that would be some brief uh, comments on political theory. And then I could briefly comment on uh, the role of consequences in ethics if that's okay with you, Amos, or do you think we should first address political theory and then return to ethics later? Sorry. <clears throat> um, I think we should um, discuss this definition a little bit uh, because there has you have covered a lot of material already and made a lot of valuable remarks. And then in a second step, perhaps, uh, try to uh, also address the role of consequences in ethics, if that's okay. So, <clears throat> so I like several things that, that you have said so far. So I think the first important point is to notice, as we have noticed many times before, that human beings are social animals and that they live, therefore, in societies or in groups or in communities, however exactly you want to call it. And then naturally by this fact, the question arises of how should this group or community or society be organized? <laughs> and I think that government in the end is the form that these people who make up this group have decided upon to organize their group. So this group basically has an, a certain organization and this organization is then what we call, uh, or that thing which directs and controls that organization is what we call the government. <clears throat> and yes, and so as you said, there are different goods that are in question here that the government is typically task, tasked with um, upholding or, or making sure that these goods are taken care of. And one of them, as you said, is um, safety against the external enemies. And the other one is the continuance of the organization itself so that this organization remains stable as the people desire it to be. And this uh, typically also has to do with um, safety against enemies from within. So people who would want to um, change the organization of this society in a manner that the other members of this society do not wish. Because I think it's <clears throat> important to keep in mind that neither the society nor its organization are absolutely uh, fixed. They both evolve over time, they are more like a process than they are like a solid, unchanging object. But still, this process in the end, because the society is made up of a group of people, the, it, it has the, its purpose is to lead to a good life for these people who make up the society and therefore it should change in accordance with their desire and not against it and perhaps here already we run into another difficulty because sometimes people desire in the short term things which are not good for them in the long term <clears throat> and a good organization of society takes this into account and has as you said, checks and balances uh, to make sure that the society functions well, not only today and tomorrow, but also over a long 
time frame even longer than the life of one individual. And so these, I think, are all things that that have to be considered around this question of what a government is and what's it, what its task is, and therefore also for our judgment, uh, whether it uh, fulfills its role well or not. Right, uh, interesting remarks you made there. So I like the use of analogies. So I would, for instance, use some analogies when examining the nature of a society and the nature of government. And I like the analogy to the human body, because in the human body, you have all sorts of different organs and they have a specific task to fulfill. And when all of those organs in the body is doing its, they're doing their task, then you have this natural harmony in the body. It's working well, it is healthy. And whenever some organ does not fulfill its natural role uh, precisely, then there will be some disorder within the body and there will be some illness or disease of some sort. And I would say the same thing about society, that there is a natural order or a natural harmony within nature of that society. And when each organ or, or part of that society it's do, is doing its job well, then you will have this natural order. Now, exactly what kind of organs there would be in social contexts, that could be contingent to a certain degree upon various circumstances, uh, time, and various cultures and places on the globe. So if you have a society in China, uh, the, the specific uh, structure of that natural order is going to be somewhat different than a society in, in America. However, there's since still going to be some fundamental uh, equalities that are natural to every society as such. And that is that there is natural order. There are certain kinds of organs like the family is, is a cornerstone of every society. And then you could speak of, of local communities governed by a, a local governor of some sort. And then you have this larger society that is being taken care by this government. So an analogy that seems to, be, uh, to have been used by many, uh, including I think Plato is that the government is sort of the head of society. So uh, similarly, uh, similar to how in a human body, you have the head um, governing and directing the body. In society, it's the government that is directing and protecting and controlling that society. So we, we thus see that the government cannot absorb the functions and the tasks of each organ because those organs are going to do that job for themselves but the head is going to direct them, not absorb their purpose, but direct them. So uh, this analogy to the human body um, is probably going to have some uh, uh, elements of incompleteness that uh, it's not going to be a perfect analogy, but I think at least those considerations are very helpful to examine or understand what a society is and, and government is. So, um, and also to what you said about uh, the, the, the society being some fixed, absolute entity, uh, that that's not the case, that it's rather a process. Yeah, I think in a certain sense, I would agree with that. Uh, I would say that in every society, there is an element of constancy and an element of change. There are certain things that stay the same. Uh, those fundamental or essential features of that society, that which makes it that particular society, but also some elements of change. Similar to, again, how the human body undergoes change throughout its various stages of maturity, but it's still in one sense, the same body. So those would be some philosophical remarks that I would um, have about this subject. Yes. Um, I, for myself, am a little bit skeptical of the analogy of the body when uh, speaking of a society or at least I think one has to be 
very careful because um, the, the analogy has some merits, but it breaks down at certain points and there the danger is to draw false inferences from it. So um, one, one problem is um, that there are different human beings with different talents, that is true, <clears throat> but it is much harder to know or to figure out what their talents are. So if you look at the body, it would be quite um, ridiculous to want the hand to direct all the body and to want the head to pick up objects because you can clearly see that they have not the characteristics for these tasks, but in fact, just the opposite way around. <clears throat> but when you look at different people in different um, positions in a society, it is oftentimes not uh, per se clear that this person is the best suited to, to inhabit this role in society. So you can have a monarch who is um, absolutely incompetent and you can have a stable cleaner who would actually be the far better monarch if he were put in that position. And so at least one uh, critical question is then how do you determine which person should take which role in the society? Because there are people with different talents and the division of labor according to their talents is a good for everyone in society. But the question of assigning the roles, I think is very difficult. That's a big question uh, that you're asking there. So yeah, here you could say that there are some, I suppose, some differences of opinion of exactly how people are selected to be suited for the best uh, tasks. Plato, in his famous work, The Republic, he famously argued that there should have this, this governing class of philosophers that determine through a, a state form of education exactly which person should be um, selected to the specific class that they are meant for according to their talents and their intelligence and, and other features. Um, but you could argue that it's more plausible to have each adult human being once childhood, childhood is finished and this person in question is reaching adulthood would then uh, examine what kind of occupation he should have. Should he be a gardener? Should he be a teacher? Should he be um, someone who makes shoes or a plumber or something else? Uh, and he could seek the advice of his family, of his close friends, of some uh, um, teacher that he knows well. Uh, in Catholic society, it would be the priest. It could also be an example of a an, person to whom you could receive advice or from whom you could see, uh, receive advice. And then that person will make an informed decision to choose the occupation that he feels he's best suited for. Um, there is some question about the element of uh, inheritance, inheritance that someone should inherit the occupation uh, that was given to him from his family, but you would say, well, this has limits because the son is not necessarily capable of the same things as the father. So there's going to be some inequalities there. So yes, I would say some, um, some, some general social norm that, okay, when you reach ad adulthood, you're going to make a decision about what you're going to do. You're going to seek the advice of your close relatives or friends or, or priest or something else, someone else, and then make an informed decision. So I would say that we could have this sort of social norm and I want, can discuss, okay, exactly the details of that norm, but at least we have a means by which people, at least to the best of their ability, attempt to find that place in society which is suited for them. For as the analogy shows, there are different people who uh, are going to fulfill certain roles and those who also are going to be different. 
Um, and then we could talk about, okay, what is the process by which this is happening? So yes, that would be some remarks uh, on this question. Yes, <clears throat> I think these are, uh, sorry. That's okay. I think these are, are good remarks and I would, I would tend to agree that um, at one part of the process is um, kind of to seek advice and then also to try to listen into yourself and to make an informed decision. And also um, we do not have to uh, specify the process by which this division of labor uh, can be done. Uh, we don't have to specify it perfectly in order to say that uh, it still is uh, valuable and, and good. So, so I guess um, I would, uh, we, can, we can agree on this point. Um, <clears throat> perhaps it would be a good time now to, to introduce or to, to talk a little bit about um, how shall we compare then these different forms of government? Because we have, <clears throat> we have kind of said what the purpose of a government is. And we have said that we would also want to um, include uh, this notion of what is the role of consequences in the organization, <clears throat> or no, what is the role of consequences in ethics as compared to perhaps uh, principles or, or what other considerations would there be according to which we can judge ethics? Sorry, could you repeat the last question or issue that you uh, mm -hmm. talked about, right? Yes, I was just wondering if besides consequences and principles, there might be some third um, option of which I haven't thought that we should also consider when uh, figuring out if something is ethically uh, valid or not. Right, that's uh, another very deep and interesting question uh, as well. Uh, but if, if you want to, we could first dive into examining different forms of government and then deal with that. Or do you want to do it the opposite way or, or what do you think? Um, I was thinking of, of going about it um, <clears throat> in this uh, order, because then we would have a basis to judge different forms of government as we discuss them. So we could say this has this consequence, but there is this principle and compare it uh, like that. Right, so we sort of attempt to find a foundation uh, from which we can then make judgments about the best form of government. Yes. Interesting, that's a very good procedure. Right, so perhaps we have to go really to the basic question of what is ethics? What is ethics all about? Uh, and I would say that ethics is about living the good life. It is about making choices to ensure that you will become a good human person. So we see then that ethics, as I understand it, is about promoting something which is objectively good and in in our context in human context ethics is about human beings promoting what is objectively good for them and that is what virtues are about virtues are the features that make up or contribute to making a good human being so that is what ethics is about it as it is about promoting that realizing or actualizing that and i would say that when you have a good human being which is the purpose of ethics um, you have something which is not merely good in a broad sense similar to how you could say well here we have a good tree because the tree is able to bear good fruit or you have a good knife because it cuts well we're talking about something deeper than that we're talking about moral goodness because since human beings have the capacity for moral choices, we have free will, we can actually choose between right and wrong. And then we choose freely 
to promote our own goodness, that goodness uh, obtains a moral character because we human beings, by virtue of having this capacity for, for free choices, our nature becomes morally significant. And thus that which is good for our nature becomes morally significant. So those are some basic metaphysical ideas concerning ethics that I would consider to be fundamental in, our, in, our, in how I view ethics, politics, etc. So uh, just some brief remarks about consequences and then you could comment on this. So I would say consequences are relevant at least when it comes to examining what you need to become a good human being, what you need to flourish in other words. And with regards to the body, here we see a lot of uh, importance with consequences. We have a body, the body is part of our identity. And if we're going to be good human beings, at least here on earth, it is necessary that our body functions well. So we can thus examine, okay, what kind of things in reality will contribute to the health of our body, like nutrition and fresh air, water, things like that. Uh, those are good and they are relevant in ethics insofar as they contribute to the goodness of the body, which again contributes or is relevant to becoming a hu good human being. So I would consider consequences as a the role of consequences seems to be within the context of finding out what you need to become a good human being. So it's not that consequences are the end because consequences are simply the results of something. The end is some particular metaphysical good and the consequences are directed toward moral goodness or virtue or human goodness as the end of those consequences. You could uh, sort of uh, say it that way. So yes, the end of ethics is rather about the state of affairs, a metaphysical state of affairs that involves some good being existing. And consequences are more about, okay, can this result contribute to that? So I hope uh, my, I help to, to um, explain my position well. Yes, thank you very much. I think this was a, a very good uh, mm, summary of, of a huge um, set of, of ideas and concepts. So I really think it was very helpful. And I also feel like I really agree with what you have said that um, as, as we have discussed before, um, human beings have this capacity of free will so they can choose to act in this way or in another way. And the, then they therefore have this moral choice between do they want to become um, a good human being or not and the the question what is a good human being comes actually uh, which is a huge question in itself comes in the end from uh, observing human nature and asking the question does this person this particular instance um, fit well to the to the to this uh, essential characteristics to this essence that we have said of what it means to be a human being <clears throat> and as you have said the virtues are then um, particular uh, instances of of habits that one should develop uh, in order to fit this description of a human being well, to, to be a good human being. And in my mind, um, I would also agree with you that principles or what you have called metaphysical principles are kind of that which defines the end of the whole enterprise. So this question of what is human nature? What then are, uh, does it mean to be according to human nature or to 
kind of develop in a direction which is in disharmony with the essence of what it means to be a human being. These are kind of principles that define the end to which uh, ethics uh, points. And then consequences are important in that sense that when we act in the world, um, we act with this end in mind. And then the question is, well, do we actually move towards this end or not? And so there the consequences are important because um, if you have a good end in mind, but you keep moving away from it, then you should notice that there is some error somewhere in what you are, in what you are doing and you should change the way you behave because you are in reality moving away from your goal and not towards it. And so that would be the role of consequences in my mind. Interesting. Yeah, perhaps that is similar to how I view it. I would sort of say that consequences are, they are morally irrelevant unless they have a reference point. And the reference point is the good of the human being, the moral good. So if you are going to examine a specific human action and you're going to find out, is this human action morally good or morally bad or morally neutral for that matter? Uh, it seems to me that a consequentialist, one who views consequences as very important in, mor in morality or ethics, would say that, well, let's judge whether this human action is good or bad, depending on what consequences uh, are result, uh, obtained from that. And it seems to me that in, in various cases, um, the consequences that are uh, specifically being uh, talked about is pleasure or pain. Does it lead to this amount of pleasure and does it avoid this amount of pain? Um, I'm not saying that this is the essence of consequentialism, but it seems that at least some consequentialists would and uh, would maintain something like this, though I'm not uh, absolutely certain. And I would say, well, why are those consequences relevant? Okay, they might uh, empirically lead to those consequences, but that doesn't really concern us unless those consequences are linked up to some deeper metaphysical end. And that end must then be some good. And that is, uh, that is, uh, essential uh, this principle I would say so also in societal um, or political contexts the the role of consequences would be again to promote or uh, protect the good society the objectively good society which is grounded in the nature of that society and its role in human flourishing so that's why it would be false to say well this social or political program is good because it will promote this amount of GDP or economic growth. Well, okay, but whether it's actually something we ought to do politically depends on whether that will be in line with the goodness of our society. And the goodness of our society is a metaphysical issue and not simply a specific quantity of uh, consequences, which again would be irrelevant unless there is a reference point to some metaphysical good. <clears throat> yes, I think you put that uh, well, that even if you say, or as we both said, that consequences can sometimes be irrelevant, the question is based on what do you judge whether this consequence is good or bad or irrelevant, morally speaking. And you need a principle on which you can judge this question. Because the, like Peterson says, the facts of reality don't speak to you directly. A consequence is in, in first instance, it's just a fact. So, okay, this is so, but how do I judge whether that is now good or bad? I need a principle to judge this and this principle 
can only be in the end a metaphysical principle. And <clears throat> as you have said, some uh, consequentialists or some current philosophers, I think today this view is quite popular. They say, well, it's self-evident that pleasure is good and pain is bad. <clears throat> and therefore they judge the consequences based on how much pleasure or pain they produce for how many people. And <clears throat> But we have to make very clear here that this is a, they have sneaked in a metaphysical principle. And if you do not agree on this principle, then you will also not agree on the judgment of the consequences. <clears throat> and I would agree with you that actually that which is morally relevant is the goodness of each individual and of the organization of society or just that which is morally good. <clears throat> And so we should judge the consequences of, um, of anything, basically, um, <clears throat> based on whether they lead to that which is morally good, that this comes into existence, or whether they destroy that which is morally good and make so that it no longer exists. Right, exactly. So the, the standard by which we judge whether a moral action, uh, an action is morally good or bad, as you say, it's based upon a metaphysical principle. And that principle I would maintain is some good. And since it is some good, it will always be essential to ethics to examine the nature of something. If you're talking about becoming a good human person, we have to know what the human person a human being essentially is and this seems to me uh, to be why you could say that ethics involves a study of human nature at least in certain aspects and i think that aristotle in his uh, book um, nicomachean ethics i haven't read it myself uh, just a very some few pages but i think he um treats of the various virtues that a good human person needs and he treats of them in the way that they contribute to have a good soul and he examines what a good soul is because there is a way we, in which we can examine what a soul essentially is and and also uh, as people generally low know we can know what a healthy and good human body is because we have all this biological um, information, anatomical information about the body so that we can judge what the body really needs to function. And that will thus be a, a rel that, that's why the study of the nature of things becomes very relevant in ethics and also in, in politics, which is a subsection of ethics, I would say. So when we're trying to, trying to find out what a good society is, we we'll have to see, okay, what is the nature of that society? And to determine that, we have to also to look at the role of society in human flourishing, because this is a very important part as we have also discussed before. Why is society relevant to ethics? Because society contributes to human flourishing. So here we see why it's uh, important to recognize that human beings are social animals, because when we organize in a society, we have some common good that multiple people uh, participates in. And all of those members can enjoy this good and that good can contribute to their objective goodness and their happiness. So uh, to say it another way, the end of ethics is the good life. The good lives involve uh, it involves a, a good social life. Therefore, a dimension of ethics is society. And that's sort of the bridge between individual ethics, ethics about how you as an individual should live your life and overall society. It's relevant for you as an individual insofar as you, by virtue of being a member of society, participates in this social good which society is all about. 
So what do you think about uh, this metaphysical consideration? Yes, I, I would very much agree. And I think, again, you have, you have put it really well that the bridge <clears throat> between these two questions with our, which are not obviously linked, um, the bridge is that human beings are social animals. And therefore, in order to be a good human being, like a human being that fits well to the definition of what a human being is, there is this aspect of being a social animal. And that, again, has an aspect of um, taking care of the society in which you live and help to maintain it in a good state. And at the same time, the good state of society is, um, as you said, has an essential role in allowing a human being to live a life according to his definition. Because if society is falling apart all around you, then you are not in the in the proper habitat of a social animal because that environment which you would actually require to to live that way as it would be um, in the definition of what a human being is that environment is in fact a society or one part of that environment one crucial part is a society consisting of other human beings. And so that really is the link of why uh, the role and why the organization of society is important, ethically speaking, and also why each individual is his individual goodness. One aspect of that has to do with how he helps to maintain and to improve the society in which he lives. Because this is like a, a circular um, connection. So uh, the good human being needs to work on the society and also at the same time he requires the society. Right, so those are important points as, as you brought up and um... Yes, we see thus that your interest and society's objective interests are united. And uh, perhaps some libertarians might react, well, isn't this a form of collectivism where you place the interests of society above the interests of the individual? But no, I maintain that if you're talking about the interests of society, that is what society really wants or at least what society really needs in order to be a good society would also be good for those members of society. So you could say that there isn't actually a contradiction between a good society and the goodness of you, a member of society, individually speaking, because a good society is that society which promotes this good that every member of that society by definition participates in, in, in various degrees. So that's also an, an interesting point that there is a unity between social goods and the individual good. And, and as we have talked about that, the, the social good is a part of your individual good um, as a, uh, to become a good human being and to flourish. And yes, uh, to mention some um, examples of how Society is very important uh, to your human flourishing. It's both when it comes to material and economic means in the sense that, well, you cannot uh, sufficiently sustain your own uh, existence uh, materially by yourself to be self-sufficient. That's a very difficult job. You have to um, have some uh, cooperation with others uh, some trade, some uh, division of labor uh, becomes necessary to have a, a, a relatively, at least to some degree, prosperous environment by which you can thrive and flourish. And, and thus you need a society to have that economic foundation. But also beyond the material, we have the more 
uh, noble or spiritual uh, uh, elements uh, that just the fact to have friends is a good for you that you can enjoy others company and that all of you multiple people can have some great thing that you can all enjoy partaking in that itself is uh, is something that human beings can um, can find joy in and can be good for their uh, development or flourishing and uh, people also by nature uh, desire some belonging that they feel that they belong to some community with a specific culture and that they want some sense of identity that they share with certain other members of the same group that seems to be natural to human beings and also another very very important thing is guidance to become a, a good human being, a rational human being who makes good choices for himself. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's necessary, or at least it's very valuable to receive advice and guidance from others, your parents, your friends, your teacher, or other kind of figures in your life that can help you make good decisions. That's a very good and important thing. So guidance is also a very uh, is a key to society so uh, this i believe also is a problem with say marxism or communism because it seems to view society only under the material or economic aspects that is all about the means of production and economics and uh, material reality and and, and uh, consumer goods and capital goods but now we have these deeper um, things that we enjoy in social life like cultural belonging, identity, and guidance, and friendship. Aristotle, he spoke very highly of friendship as an extremely valuable and noble good in, in human flourishing. And also we say that family obviously is, is essential. When you are a child, you need to have uh, parents to take care of you and to have guidance from them. That's extremely important. And, and the family is a cornerstone of society, it must be, because it's so intimately connected to maturity and human development. So those would be some um, principles by which we could say, or examples by which we could say, well, truly society is good, ethically good. Yes, I think uh, you mentioned a bunch of good examples here. I would <clears throat> just add one more that I was thinking about recently, um, and that is procreation. So a human being by himself will die at some point and then there will be no more human being left. So even in that very fundamental sense, the smallest unit that can exist um, throughout time is not the individual, but a group or yeah a group of individuals and then you could of course say yeah but they could all be just like like atoms uh not interacting at all with each other except procreating perhaps like some lower animals but there of course you have mentioned uh, a couple of other examples that uh say why um that isn't uh, fitting to, to the definition of a human being as we understand it. For example, a person who has no friends or no social contacts, we would see that kind of, that is, is, uh, is not uh, normal. It's kind of, uh, and we feel like there is some, some deficiency in this person's life. There is something important missing which is a part of a good human life and of human nature in that sense. So I think perhaps we are now somewhat equipped to start uh, comparing different forms of, of government or of organization of society. Mm. And of course you have started already a bit by, by bringing in Marxism. <clears throat> So I was just wondering now um, how we would, um, in this general question of uh, 
should one person or a small group or all people together somehow um, have a say in the organization and further advance or defining of change in their society, where, where would Marxism actually fit into this? Because Marx talks of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is kind of an oxymoron even now that I think about it, because a dictatorship um, is uh, typically thought of as one person being the dictator, but then the proletariat would kind of be a large mass of people. So I'm not quite sure just now thinking about it, how we would uh, classify this in this general distinction between monarchy, aristocracy and democracy. Yes, those are big questions that you uh, mentioned there. Right, so one thing that could be said uh, a general uh, remark about finding out what kind of society we should have and what kind of government we should have. Um, some arguments that would thus be relevant for that is what kind of government or social organization would be most in line with the common goods of that society. So again, common goods are those goods which we actualize by being a society and all members of society by nature participates in that social or common good and thus it uh, contributes to their individual human flourishing and as you mentioned common goods involve material and economic uh, things like uh, producing food and other things that can help people to survive and to live well bodily speaking and, and thus we see that well economics is is as uh, is relevant to society but also there are cultural goods, there are spiritual goods, guidance and procreation, as you mentioned, that's another very good example. And also a brief remark about that, since procreation is the, the absolutely necessary foundation of every society by virtue of the fact that if you don't procreate, society will die. At least some people will have to do that. So that's why we could say that the family is more fundamental than overall society, because the family is the, the guarantee that you can have this environment of a good form of procreation. The, the basis of the family is procreation and then helping that uh, new person become an, a fully mature adult human person. So this is necessary in order for the state and society to exist. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see that you can say the family is more fundamental than society. Right. So. When it comes to Marxism, I'm not an expert in the philosophy of Marxism, and it seems to be different branches. Uh, I know that some Marxists, uh, some Marxists, they uh, they despise uh, Stalinism, while other Marxists would uh, say that no, Stalinism is is good, and even though some would be Maoists, and so would say no, 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 we should actually be libertarian Marxists. That actually Marx was more of a libertarian figure and would completely despise even Lenin. So there are different sec uh, subsections within Marxism, but it seems to me that Marx meant that once the the working class should overthrow the capitalist class in society then the working class would themselves basically be in charge of the states. And exactly how this is going to happen, that's a very good question. I think Marxists themselves would say, or would present different answers, like a libertarian Marxist would say, well, actually, this would be a very decentralized form of government. But uh, say uh, Vladimir Lenin, he would say, no, actually, the solution here is to have one guy or a few persons to rule on behalf of the working class. So instead of the working class collectively directly uh, controlling the state, they appoint one guy or a few people to do that. And that's exactly what happened in Soviet Union and other communist countries in the 10th, 20th century. So that would, I suppose, be in practice, an example of rule by one, or perhaps rule by a small elite. Now, this 
rule by one or rule by small elite in, in the communist case would be so extreme because you have a planned economy, the state, the government controls everything. And it tries to abolish essential aspects of society, religion, family, uh, and everything becomes uh, within this total state, which directs, not only directs and protects society, which is the, the function of government as we talked about, but it actually absorbs these features, the state, sort of pre presents its own religion instead of having religion as something separate from the state, the religion of communism, is, if you will. Uh, private property is abolished, private businesses uh, they're abolished, the family is abolished, religion is abolished. So there you would have uh, something more extreme than simply a government ruled by, by one or by a few, but the government itself trying to become society in a sense. So, yes, those are some remarks I would say about uh, Marxism or, or communism. So, yes. Yes, I, I think that was an interesting remark that you made there at the end, that, um, that the problem with this uh, horrible experiment that we have seen in, in the Soviet Union might not have been the organizational form of aristocracy per se, but more the fact that, to speak in your metaphor, the head tried to be the whole body. So that the government tried to take over all kinds of, of tasks, which is not its proper domain. So, that's and I think that's an interesting uh, point, really. Now, I wanted also to bring in a different consideration when we try to compare different forms of government. And I think I'm thinking here of of the problem of of human sinfulness, if you can call it that way. So this fact that human beings with some part, they strive towards the good, towards being good human beings and to fulfill their nature properly, to live a good life and not only in the moment, but in the long term and to work in society and all these things that we have said. But then there is also this other aspect of human beings that they can fall away from from the right way and by all kinds of reasons typically having to do <clears throat> with more short-term materialistic egoistic desires so basically just saying well i just want this right now and i don't care about the long-term consequences or the goodness or all of this stuff i just want this now <clears throat> and if we i believe that every human being has beside his um, desire for goodness also has a part in him that does evil or strives towards evil or or desires thing things which are contrary to uh, that which a good human being would uh, be. And with this fact in mind, there is also a big question of a social organization has to be such that this bad tendency is kept in check, that, that each, like whenever some human being tries to follow his bad tendency, then there are a couple of other people around who can kind of pull him back and bring him back on the right track. And also, if some person really cannot be brought back on the right track, then the societal organization has to make sure that he cannot produce just an immeasurable amount of harm, but also that the harm that each person can do is somehow uh, limited. So I think these are also important considerations. 
Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, human beings are imperfect. We have these weaknesses. We have the, this tendency of committing evil. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are evil by nature, but we have the tendency to commit evil. And this is something that society has to take into account because society, again, is based upon human nature. And since this tendency to, to evil is an element of human nature, society has to take that into account. And as you pointed out, there must be some structures or some something within a society to, to uh, make sure that our tendency to evil is controlled at least to some degree. And this is very true, that's a very good point. And we see this uh, various forms of, of trying to solve this, at least keep uh, our weaknesses in check. For instance, in the family, we have the father and also the mother uh, who would punish their children if they do something really bad. And that's a way to, to keep their children in, to, to make sure that the children don't go too far with their wrongdoings. And they would also guide them and teach them uh, virtues and help them to, to avoid that which is evil. And this is uh, a view that uh, also Aristotle, I believe, uh, held that uh, education itself is about making people love the good and hate the evil. That's a quote attributed to him. And you could say that, yes, the, the role of education, the role of the family is uh, indeed its most important um, role is to help children and members of society to overcome their own weaknesses and promote virtue and avoid vice. And thus you have that in the family and uh, more broadly in society. <laughs> In, in local community, uh, you should have, uh, for instance, the, the norm of things being taboo or that some human beings, if they commit a, a really bad thing, then society would condemn them. And they would perhaps even in some cases be socially shunned, at least until they say repent and do penance of that as a way to keep them in, in check. And also you have, uh, you have uh, some local government or national government uh, having laws. And if you break those laws, you are thus punished. So we have all these different ways of trying to control human weaknesses. And because of this fact that we human beings, we have this tendency to evil, that is an important uh, feature uh, within the more traditional or conservative way of viewing society and politics. That's why there is a, an, a good role and a necessary role for punishment, for taboos, for social shunning, for uh, both families and local entities. And of course, in, in Christianity, there would be the Catholic Church also have a very important role in condemning evil and, and, and having penalties for grave public sins to have these institutions in place to at least uh, control human weaknesses to some extent. Obviously, it cannot be done to a perfect degree, but at least to some extent, uh, there are institutions for that. So yes, that's, a, that's an important uh, fact to keep in mind. Yes, <clears throat> I, I think you, uh, one thing that, uh, you, you said again many useful things. I think one thing is that uh, this view that human beings also have an aspect which is sinful or imperfect or has a tendency towards evil. I think this is more, more generally understood in the conservative part of society and is kind of lacking in the more liberal part of society so <clears throat> I would agree with that and I would also agree that um, for this reason the idea of um, social control as you have alluded to it or control by parents in the family or also that 
there are certain laws which which punish uh, evil behavior um, is uh, in my mind correct now when we talk about comparing governments uh, there is this great quote from from a film that i once saw um, who watches the watchmen so we have uh, certain institutions that are tasked with um, guiding and holding back and also perhaps punishing other people when they are doing wrong. But then the question is, what if these human beings in these institutions themselves do wrong? Because also they are human beings and also they are therefore imperfect and sinful and have a tendency towards evil. And so in my mind, uh, one important question when judging a government or a, a system of organizing society is <clears throat> how well can this system also deal with the imperfection of the people who acquire a high position in the system themselves? So let's say, how well can a democracy deal with uh, if uh, the general public becomes more and more uh, just let themselves go and follow their whim and uh, basically vote based on egoistic and, and evil motives instead of based on the good? Or how well can a monarchy fix the fact when an evil a uh, person becomes the monarch or how well can an aristocracy fix the problem when uh, most of the aristocrats no longer have the good of society in mind but just exploit everyone for their own sake so i think there is in my mind a, a crucial uh, problem well i would say that uh... Well, one principle is that every type of government is going to have uh, this possibility that uh, those with considerable um, amount of me or measure of power could be corrupt themselves. That is true of, of every system, I would say. Um, but at the same time, it seems to me that this, this hierarchical structure in society will at least try to some extent to, to avoid the problem that if you have, if you have someone who's been corrupt, but he has a superior that is sort of above him in authority, then that superior could then uh, uh, correct him, rebuke him, or perhaps uh, punish him, or even depose him. And you could sort of speak of a hierarchy in, in that. So in the Catholic Church, for instance, you have the priest, and you have the bishop, and then mm -hmm. eventually you have the pope. And if, if the priest is doing very bad well then the bishop will come in and, and take care of it if the bishop is bad well perhaps the pope will intervene um, and also uh, in in um, in public uh, society it has been a case in the middle ages for instance and i remember uh, talking about this once before as well that if a monarch were really really bad the pope uh, the pope could excommunicate him or even depose him that the people could now no longer recognize him as a monarch. So that was a very interesting example of a checks, uh, check and balance. So yes, I believe this hierarchical system of superiors controlling inferiors seems to be a workable system, though not, of course not perfect because you could also have superiors doing, doing wrong. And if, if you have a superior who's above you, who's corrupt and doing something wrong and you're below him in authority, True, you cannot overthrow him because he is your superior. But if he, let's say, commands you to do something horrible, then you can disobey him. So to the, the principle that you disobey bad things done by those above you, that's that's an important uh, restriction on checks and balances. But, but anyways, uh, another very important thing I would say about this is that it's important for society to have uh, various sorts of social institutions with their own tasks and goals and that the government by no means try to absorb 
those institutions, similar that, uh, to what we said before, that it would be absurd for the head to begin to do things that is proper to the body's hand or feet or internal organs even. Obviously, that wouldn't work. And in society as well, I believe that those who sort of can be called government, like uh, kings or, or, or those below the kings, uh, military leaders, etc., they have a very limited role in what they're going to do. They do things like uh, uh, warfare or agreements with other countries. They take care of the religion inside uh, and things like that. But they do not try to control or regulate the everyday life of each local community. So we have various organs, again, this analogy, in society and these organs do their own job. And we should have a society where, you, where it would be unthinkable for this uh, huge uh, or very national government, for instance, trying to regulate everyday life uh, to the citizens when that is rather something that is proper in much more local um, settings. So decentralization and distribution of various tasks and roles to many different sorts of groups I think that's important. And it's very sad that in modern society, the state as well as big corporations have now absorbed so many things that were previously uh, done by the family, by local communities, by the church, by monasteries or, um, or other forms of, of institutions or unions. Uh, yeah, or mutual aid societies. And so that, that's very sad. So we have to reverse that trend. That's, and that's also important to keep in mind. Yes, <clears throat> uh, there are many interesting things that I would like to comment to what you have said before. Um, I think just to the last point that you have made, I would agree that today the trend is for institutions to amass um, power or to amass influence over areas of life which are actually uh, not their proper domain and that is a huge problem and i see myself i believe that the cause of this problem has to do with this uh, one expression of this tendency towards evil and that is the desire to acquire power over other human beings and to be able to control and direct every move and behavior that they make. And in my mind, this clearly is something which is bad and which uh, has harmful effects on society and also on these common goods, which we have said, which are the cause for why society is even morally relevant. Um, and then there is another very interesting comment, which I have just now again come to realize. I have come to realize this already before. Um, as you said, um, every type of government has the problem that those in power can become corrupt. And I'm not sure, I think there was some uh, famous political philosopher who said, a monarchy is the best system of government if the king is virtuous and it is the worst form of government is if the king is evil. So because it's it's so absolute, whereas if you have a democracy, then there might be more uh, shades because perhaps there are two thirds of the people are more or less good and one third is quite evil and then you have some kind of, of mix. Um, not saying that people are good or evil, uh, strictly speaking, but that they allow themselves to drift towards that which is evil or more work on themselves towards that which is good. And so I think the conclusion I always come to in the end is that that which really matters is whether each individual tries as hard as he can to be a good human being, to do that which is right and to acquire virtues and to 
to really try to avoid that which is evil and not just let oneself go or even actively go in the evil direction because um, you can have a monarchy where the king is really concerned about the good of his subjects and he will choose a, uh, a follower which is also very concerned about the good of his subjects and he listens to the people who give him good advice and all the people in the state uh, accept his benevolent rule and try to do their own task as good as they can and that will be a wonderful society to live in. And also you can have a democracy where everybody, when he votes, really thinks of that which is good for society as a whole and not just that which increases his own profit or his own power. And that will also be a very beautiful society to live in. And then you can have both opposites as well. And so that's really uh, the point I, I come to every time is that I'm not even sure if there is such a thing as a better or worse system. But when I really think about it deeply, then it seems that it mostly depends on, uh, on the ethics of each individual. And perhaps, yes, uh, we could go into the question of incentives also. If the incentives for evil are very large, will people be more inclined towards it, but I will stop here for the moment. Yeah, those are very deep and very interesting uh, subjects and points that you brought up there. So yes, I, I would think also that the choices of each individual to become a good person, that is really, really important and relevant to this whole question of a good society. And uh, I believe that even though I would say that certain forms of government are better than others, still, if you have a good monarchy or a good aristocracy or a good democracy, so even if you have um, good citizens, virtuous citizens to truly do what is objectively good, then that would be great, whether it is a democracy or an aristocracy or a monarchy. That's a very good point. Now, that being said, I would say that to some extent, uh, we could say that certain forms of government are better than others. So yes, I would put it this way that yes, it's true. Some forms of government are better than others, but it doesn't matter uh, the most in society. There are other things that matters more than whether it is a monarchy or an aristocracy. For instance, I would say uh, that uh, the religious beliefs and the religious organization of that society is more important than whether it is monarchical or aristoc an aristocracy. So that's an example of, of, of that principle. So uh, that being said, if we were to go into the question of, okay, why is one particular form of government better than the other if we have to compare them? Well, then I would, I would um, say that uh, I, I have, I, leave some arguments that that monarchy is better than the two others for various reasons and I would um, I would just support monarchy and again I don't uh, say that I support absolute monarchy where the monarch has absolute power it would it would be uh, limited to some extent and also there has been done um, distinctions between uh, pure monarchy and mixed monarchy so pure monarchy is a government in which there is one who rules and that's it, nothing else more than that. But uh, the idea of a mixed monarchy is a system in which you do have a monarchy, you do have a king and he truly rules politically, but you also have other institutions who in their own way participate in the power of the state. So you also have an aristocracy who has some um, importance in the political power. And you could say even the people in some way have, have a say in that they can decide locally in their own community various issues about how that is going to function. So there is an element of all three government uh, systems. So uh, yes, and uh, yes, I think that's an interesting quote you brought up there um, that 
monarchy is the best when the king is virtuous, but the worst when he is really bad, like a tyrant. And uh, I remember reading this uh, in a work by St. Thomas Aquinas, and he maintained the same thing um, that, uh, that which you said. And he would argue that the best way then to make sure that the king will be good is his solution would be the Christian religion. Because independently of whether you believe that the Christian religion is true or false, it at least uh, you, you could argue that uh, it, it is a very powerful incentive to be good because if you believe that, well, your actions will be judged by a God in the afterlife and you will end up either in, in heaven or hell or purgatory, then you will have a powerful incentive in that way to, to, to behave well, to put it that way. So that was, a, that was an interesting argument for why Christianity should be the religion of, of the state. Uh, uh, regardless of whether you believe Christianity is true or false. But um, yes, if you want, we could go into some of the arguments for why monarchy is better, uh, which I would maintain, or we could talk about some other aspect of what we have now discussed. <clears throat> yes, I would be interested in your arguments for why monarchy is in some sense better, though, <clears throat> I do quickly have to comment that I think this, uh, this idea by Thomas Aquinas that Christianity will be a help to make the king better, I think it's, uh, it's false. Because if, of course, a person doesn't believe that the metaphysical claims of Christianity are true, namely that there is a heaven and a hell and a God who will judge him after his death, then this will have no effect on his behavior, <clears throat> even if he professes just by his words to be a Christian so that he can be elected or made the king. So I don't think that this works. I think it works probably if a person truly believes the doctrines of Christianity, but then it would also work if he truly believed doctrines of other religions. And at the same time, it will not work if he just pretends to believe them, but actually doesn't, then it will not have any effect on him at all. Well, uh, to that uh, latter point, you said, well, it's possible that you could have a king who, who professed the Christian faith in public, did, didn't really believe it in private. But I would say, well, that is practically no different from him not having any religion. So you could say at least by having Christianity being that religion of that society, at least there is a much higher chance that the king will actually believe it rather than not having that religion evolved in politics at all, to say it that way. Uh, so it's, it's better than nothing, you could say. Um, Yes, yes, uh, what but, you, yes sorry. but what if you live in a in a Hindu society where people generally believe in karma, then there would be a higher chance of the king also believing in karma and therefore being a virtuous human being because he doesn't want to be reborn as a donkey. So you could make the same argument there. So there is nothing very special about Christianity in that regard, I would say. Well, I would say that the idea of reincarnation, even though you said, yes, I don't want to be reborn as something lower than myself, uh, the idea of an internal hell would seem to be more frightening. Uh, and, and the idea of, of eternal bliss in heaven would seem more rewarding than what Hinduism has to offer. Um, if you, you could call comment on that or we could move on to some other issues. We can, we can move on, yes. Great, okay, so yes, uh, one of the arguments for monarchy, I would say, is that it makes more sense if you think of it metaphysically or, or naturally, if you consider the nature of a society. And a very fundamental uh, value for society is unity. The idea that there is a oneness something by which that society is united. And of course, those common goods of society is something by which all the members are united 
because there is one good that they all participate in. And you could say that a government uh, has in some way, the government needs to be, to have unity in some way, because unity is fundamental to society metaphysically and it makes sense to say that well the government since since it is the fundamental feature of society to be united to have one thing by which many are united it makes sense that the government should have as a, a fundamental interest to promote the unity of society a certain oneness so if you have division and discord and uh, multiplicity in in this regard that would contradict the the, the very nature of what that society is supposed to be. Now, the best way to have unity in government, all other things being equal, seems to be if you have one guy who you could say controls that government. Because if you have multiple people controlling that government, it's true it's possible that they could all agree and be united to have one plan, uh, one, plan one frame of mind, etc. But of course, if you have one person, he will be he will have more unity because he's one person. He, he couldn't have other people who could potentially disagree with him. He's one person, and therefore he would have practice unity in that way because he's one agent instead of having made many agents who could potentially disagree with other with each other. So this is a more sort of metaphysical argument that unity, oneness would make somewhat more sense if you have one person instead of multiple. And also you could speak of it uh, being better in a practical way that if you're going to have a government making decisions, it would be all other things being equal, uh, better to have one guy who has the final authority about what decision is going to be made because if you have multiple people controlling that government, well, if they disagree about the decision, then that's a problem. They cannot actually uh, govern in that case. But if you have one guy who has the final word, then that division will be removed that you can you could have one decision to follow. Um, another argument would be that, would be an argument for analogy that we see in various other cases, both in human society and, and even in nature in a more uh, general way that unity, uh, things that have unity are governed by one. So in the traditional family, you would have one head, which is the father. In a business, it is usually one who is the head of that business, a CEO or something like that. Um, and in, in, the, in the, the church, you have one bishop, etc., etc. So uh, this seems to be uh, also in nature, this idea that there is one head, like among bees, there is one queen bee, uh, etc. Another argument is an argument from history or experience. If you look throughout the history of mankind, overwhelmingly, human society has practiced monarchy. There have been some few, few examples of democracy and republics, but the overwhelming majority of human societies have been governed uh, by monarchy all over the world, across every culture, time, contingent factor you could think of monarchy has been this very, very strong, uh, it has an extremely strong presence in, in human society and in mankind in general. And that seems to reflect a general human tendency that there is something natural about monarchy, uh, right? So yes, those are some arguments in favor of monarchy, which I would say, well, it's not, like extremely important overall. I mean, there are other factors, of course, that have a lot to say about society. But if we just judge each uh, kind of form of government and just compare them and that all of the factors being equal, I think those are some plausible arguments. Interesting, interesting. So now um, I, I can uh, make some, some retorts, uh, mostly critical to what you have said. <clears throat> so I would agree that um, unity is a very important, um, very important for a society and division actually can lead to 
either the society breaking apart into two societies, but most often it leads to a lot of, of violence and, and uh, a lot of trouble. So I do agree that unity is um, an important, um, is to be desired in a society. However, I do not necessarily agree for two reasons, that just because you have one person leading the government or leading this society, that the society will have unity. And the first reason is, of course, that there might still be a division between the opinions of the people in this society. So perhaps half of the people will say, yes, this decision by our king is great. And the other half will say, this decision is absolutely horrible. And so the society will still be divided even though they have a king. So you cannot just impose unity, but unity actually is achieved only if all of the members of society mostly agree on most of the important questions of how this society should be run or should be organized. So just because you have one king doesn't mean that the society has unity as also many historical examples show. And the second problem is of course that the king might not even have unity within himself. So from modern psycholo psychological uh, studies, we know that a person is not just one unitary block, but a person has all kinds of dynamics in his head. So a king might change his mind about a certain policy once every month because he is internally conflicted about this issue and he might be schizophrenic or he might have all kinds of uh, things going on inside his mind so that even the leadership itself must not have unity just because there is one person so that is to address your first point now um da, 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 da. You said that if one guy has the final authority, uh, it, it will be a problem if many people have um, a say in the direction of a society and they cannot agree on what to do. But of course, there are measures that can be taken so that there will still be a decision. So just as an example, in Switzerland, we have seven people running the executive branch of the of the government and these seven people they just vote and there is always a majority when you have seven and so there is always a decision uh, that's just one of many possible examples um, and yeah concerning the historical uh, examples that there were mostly monarchies in history I guess that is true, but that doesn't, to me, prove that uh, monarchy is the best or even a good system per se. That's not necessarily an argument, because on the one point, you can say that life was also quite wretched in many societies throughout history. And also, for example, most societies throughout history were not Christian but still you would maintain that Christianity is the best religion of a society. So historical, um, I do see that it should be considered, but it's not a, a, an argument per exactly for like a, a theoretical argument why this system is better than that. Perhaps the best system hasn't been discovered yet. Well, many points there. Um, yeah, to respond to each. Uh, so the first point was that uh, to, to simply have one person directing the government doesn't mean that you will have unity in society. 
And of course, obviously, just because the king says something and decides something, that doesn't mean that everyone in society would agree. Uh, I didn't argue that. I rather argue that uh, unity would be more practiced in the political context, not in the social context overall in that community, but at rather it is more metaphysically speaking unity by having one guy uh, taking control over society uh, in, in this particular respect compared to multiple people. That it would be more metaphysically speaking unity in that context, in that political context. Uh, compared to other uh, forms of government. So um, and there was one point about that that I just had, but I think I forgot it, unfortunately. But okay, over to the other point. Yes, of course, it's very true that uh, a, a king could change his mind um, and be uncertain and have different considerations. But still, it would, it would still be the case that whenever one person makes the decision it is that one person it is that that oneness and even if you have the possibility of him changing his mind or having concerns well that is even more true if you have multiple people controlling government that would just be an even bigger problem if you have multiple people and all of them could change their minds in all these different directions but if you just have one person to um, to to do things then it would be compared to multi a multiplicity, it would be more unity. So uh, to the, the next point about, it would be easier to have final decisions with one guy instead of multiple. Uh, and you said, well, you can have measures to, to avoid that problem. Let's say you have voting, like you mentioned Switzerland having that system to some extent. And yes, that is a possible way to solve that, but voting is more burdensome than if you have just one guy making the decisions because they could be everyday decisions that needs to be taken uh, at a very short amount of time and it would be easier if we have one guy in charge who will then make the best uh, will make a decision in that context because otherwise you would then need to have a vote every single time you're going to have a decision and that could be costly or ineffective or inefficient uh, and also another thing is that if you have one guy who has the responsibility of making decisions, he would uh, obtain experience from that. And he would just be, you could say, by that fact, um, generally speaking, perhaps better equipped because he would have that experience uh, instead of multiple people uh, having votes. Because if you have one guy, then he will have a lot to do with making final decisions and he will be better at it and have more experience. That of course doesn't mean that that will necessarily happen. But if we're going to make comparisons theoretically between different forms, I would say that's an, an, an argument. Uh, okay, so when it comes to uh, history, I would say that if you see something being practiced in society, uh, the vast majority, of societies throughout history across cultures and other uh, and, and places and times, uh, I would say it's a powerful indicator that there is something natural and practical about that form of society because you could then ask, well, why is monarchy the overwhelming uh, case instead of some other government? Well, it seems to be that it's, it's more natural and, and better uh, and more natural for people to organize in that way. And it's true that, well, just because many, many societies practice something, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that that which they practice is true and good. As you mentioned, it's true most societies are not be Christian. So I would rather formulate it this way that if you see something practiced almost universally in history, it's a powerful indicator that what they do is natural and practical. However, it's possible that there could be some even more important concerns that override that indicator. But I don't see any other things overriding monarchy. So I would say that, that we could go by that indicator unless there is something more important. In the case of Christianity, we have something more important to consider. And that's, for instance, the arguments for why Christianity is true. So 
Yes, and also I would also say that it's still true that it's natural and practical for human beings to practice monarchy, or it, it would be a powerful indicator if we see that being almost universally practiced, that would at least make it very plausible to say that it's natural for human beings to organize that way. And that again would be relevant because when we consider what's the best form of government, it would be that form of government or society, which is best in accordance with human nature. So I would sort of bridge the relevance in that just to, to clarify or explain some particular aspect. Um, yeah, if you want to respond, you can uh, just go ahead. <laughs> Yes, I would. So I think we can leave the, the historical question aside because I would agree with you that it is a, a good indicator when something is observed uh, very frequently. But as you said yourself, then you have to compare the arguments. So is there any argument against it or not? And so we can just stick with the arguments and I would leave the historical majority of cases aside, if that's okay for you. Um, yeah, concerning the unity, <clears throat> I mean, the way you said it before, of course, it is true that one person <clears throat> symbolizes unity better than let's say a group of people, <clears throat> but to me, that is not a that's not a particularly important uh, point because the question is what unity is actually desired unity of what unity of the person <clears throat> or unity of the society or unity of the decision of the government and depending on the answer to this question then uh, a different form of government might be better because um, it seems to me quite plausible that one person will change their mind far more uh, vo with far more volatility than an entire population of a country. So that's what you see typically in every uh, democratic uh, vote. The, the result is something like 49 against 51 percent or perhaps uh, 48 against 52 or something like that and so and that doesn't just change from day to day and so one of the arguments in favor of having uh, all people of a society to some extent involved in the making of the decision at least I think that was uh, Rousseau's idea amongst others, is that their individual biases will cancel each other out, but their, but their knowledge or, or beliefs of what is actually good for society will then um, kind of be balanced against each other and that which more people believe to be good for society is that which then will be decided. And now, of course, you cannot have a vote in the whole population on every small detailed question, but still in the big and important questions, I would think that this is actually a better way of reaching a sensible result than just having one person decide based on, on their own uh, judgment or whim or preference or just how they feel in that moment, um, because that can fluctuate very much as we also know from our own experience. And again, there is another argument in favor of having all of society involved in the decision-making. It's actually two arguments. The first argument is that society, as we have defined it, is also for the good of all of its members. It's not just for the good of the king or of the aristocracy, but it's for the good of all of its members. And therefore, it seems the most plausible to me to ask all of its members um, in some form uh, what they actually think would be good. And 
also uh, when, as we have talked before about uh, that a person shouldn't uh, or an institution shouldn't take control over something which uh, she doesn't, uh, is not in her uh, proper domain. Um, how should the king know best what uh, some local person in some local village uh, requires? He cannot know that. It's completely impossible because each person has the most detailed knowledge about his immediate environment and at best a very superficial knowledge about something which happens far away. And therefore, this, when, when all people are partaking in the decision making, then also all of this knowledge is somehow mixed together in this decision. Whereas if just one person makes the decision, then um, it's just the knowledge of one person. And even though this person might be very much smarter and more virtuous than all the other people in society, still all of the others together know far more than he does alone. Well, many points that you uh, brought up there. And um, uh, uh, first, a brief uh, remark. I would say that with some of the things you said, uh, I agree, actually. But I would say that some of the points which you made that I agree with, I wouldn't say they are a problem for the monarchical uh, idea that I have in mind. Now, I would very much enjoy to uh, respond to your points and discuss them further. However, uh, unfortunately, it seems that uh, the time is a bit of a problem because it's already 15.09 at the day and I had in mind eating some lunch so I would uh, hope not to have that too late so I would ask you this question whether you would be interested to continue this debate or discussion about monarchy uh, and, and continue where we left off right now and have a part two uh, at a later occasion um, I ask again, and again, I would be interested in, in discussing this more right now, but I'm thinking of, of eating lunch not too late today. So, yeah, so, sorry for that about the time, but yeah, what do you think? <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, I think we could, we could do so. Um, I'm just now wondering, so, so I will cut it off here. I think I can stop the recording right now.